Welcome to today's program, Fortifying the Future, Building Resilience in the Age of Dis Disinformation. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Susan Elliott, and I'm the President and CEO of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. And we're very pleased to have uh, welcome our audience and also our distinguished panelists. This is the second in our series of discussions about how we can build resilience in the age of disinformation. While social media channels and new technologies have rightly been lauded to foster community and to bridge global divides, they also can create challenges when weaponized by nefarious actors. The long-term and deeply embedded relationships within in NATO and trans Atlantic relations more broadly can provide the material that we need to build resistance and to fortify against future hostile information threats. So we only have an hour and we have quite a distinguished panel and a lot to cover. So what I'll do is I'll introduce our panelists and then I'll turn the conversation over to our moderator, Nicholas Thompson. So I want to first start with Benjamin Hadid who's the senior director of the Europe Center at the Atlantic Council. He's an expert in European politics and transatlantic relations, and previously served as a fellow at the Hudson Institute. He has published extensively in the US and European media, and his recent book, Paradise Lost, Europe in the World of Trump, makes the case for greater European unity in a world of new challenges and threats. We also have Dominika Haidu, and she is the head of the Center for Democracy and Resilience at the GlobeSec Policy Institute. There she focuses on the impact of information operations and social media on a democratic society, cognitive security and strategic communication in the public sector. Dominica has also been engaged in the advertising sector and with the EU policymaking uh, has trained um, EU's Committee of Regents. We also have Yakub Yanda, and he specializes in the response of democratic states to hostile disinformation and influence operations. He is a director with the European Values Center for Security Policy and associate fellow at the Slovak Security Policy Institute. He serves as a member of the editorial board of the expert panel in the antipropaganda.sk and is a proud member of the active reserves of the Czech Armed Services. And we have also James uh, Pament, who is associate professor at Lund University, previously having served as a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. His research focuses on how states influence one another through strategic communication, diplomacy, intelligence, aid, and propaganda. And the moderator of today's discussion is Nick Thompson, who is the CEO of The Atlantic, and he previously served as the editor-in-chief of Wired, Wired Magazine. He's held numerous editorial positions across the media landscape, often engaging with stories involving technology, politics, and law. He's the author of the book, The Hawk and Dove, Paul Nietzsche, George Kennan, and the History of the Cold War. And most importantly, he currently serves as a trustee uh, for the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. So I just want to remind our participants that today's discussion is on the record and we're recording it. So if you know someone who missed today's discussion, it will be up on our uh, YouTube website shortly. Um, if you'd like to pose a question to the panel, please go down to the bottom of your screen and use the Q&A box so you can uh, type in your question. So we'll, the panel will talk for probably 30 to 40 minutes and then we'll begin to enter, entertain your questions. So please uh, feel free um, to put them in the Q&A box. And finally, I'd like to express my thanks to NATO's Public Diplomacy Division for their support of the NCAFP's series on this important topic. So thanks again to everybody for participating and thanks to our distinguished panelists. And I'll turn the discussion now over to Nick. Thank you very much, Susan. What a kind introduction. And thank you to everybody for coming and to NATO to supporting this and to everybody for supporting the National Committee, which is a wonderful organization. So we're talking about disinformation and resilience. Let's start with disinformation. We had a fabulous panel last week. I hope some of you were able to catch it. But I'd love to begin by asking Dominica to tell us a little bit about some of the disinformation campaigns that we've seen recently in Europe that we're seeing right now help set the stage for what we're going to need to build resilience against. So, Dominica, good morning. 
Good morning, everyone, and thanks again uh, for the invitation. It's a real pleasure for me to be speaking at this panel. Um, so regarding disinformation in Europe, it's probably no surprise to anyone that COVID-19 has dominated the disinformation landscape for the past two years. Um, but what the COVID did actually is that it somehow accelerated the um, ability to, of, of the disinformation actors to cooperate. It accelerated their ability to actually um, exploit the, the fears of, of the society and accelerated their creativity um, in, in, in some respect as well. Um, so especially in countries where there is high distress towards, towards institutions, um, the disinformation actors have been able to spread um, campaigns which scenes, the, the, the measures, the restrictions, and actually led to, um, um, to, to sow further distrust and, and undermine the institutions, the democratic institutions. When it comes to new mechanisms that we observed, as, as I mentioned, um, um, we have been able to see um, a lot more cooperation between these actors. So different disinformation actors um, who have previously been done their own thing um, have been cooperating a lot more and learning from each other. Just to give you a very specific example, um, in Slovakia, we were where I come from, we were monitoring um, the COVID uh, disinformation campaigns uh, during the first wave in 2020. And what we saw is that previously, um, disinformation, disinformation actors were primarily um, sourcing from uh, um, sources such as Sputnik or RT, so primarily like Russian sources or to some extent Chinese. But now um, they started also sourcing from, from Western disinformation actors, including Alex Jones. So for example, there was this page called Chemtrail Slovakia, and they were able to take the videos which were produced by Alex Jones from YouTube, which were actually, which had been banned by YouTube, um, and they dubbed them in a very professional way into Slovak and shared them on Slovak Facebook. And those posts had thousands and thousands of, of, of shares. So they were also again into other sources, uh, also produced in, in Western Europe and in, in the USA as well um, by the conspiracy theorists there. And by, by this means, the disinformation scene just big, got, got bigger and more coordinated in, in terms of narratives that they share. I should add that Dominica was not susceptible to this disinformation because I do know that she just got her third vaccine shot. So she did not believe the Alex Jones videos. I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, James, do you think that is an accurate um, representation of what you're seeing or have you seen other things in Europe and other ways the disinformation actors are communicating or coordinating that the audience should be aware of? Um, I do, thank you, Nicholas. Um, and thank you for the very kind um, invitation. Um, yeah, I think that was a really good overview of what's been happening. Um, one thing that, that I can maybe add that we saw during the coronavirus pandemic was more constructive use of disinformation. So whereas in the past, traditionally, disinformation is used in a destructive way to undermine trust in public debate, to infiltrate both sides, play them against each other. You know, Russia and China both had a stake through their own vaccines, through their own reputations, in trying to actually produce constructive disinformation and to build a constructive image. So I think I would just add, you know, to what Dominica said, which, um, which is just worth mentioning, is that it may be a slightly new phase where the people spreading the disinformation are beginning to think about their own images uh, and to pursue their own positive interests, constructive interests, also using disinformation as part of the tool set. By that you mean that the goal of Russian and Chinese originated disinformation was not just to sow dissent in American societies, it was also to increase support for Russian and Chinese vaccines? Yeah, exactly. And, and to manage particularly China's image um, as, as the source of coronavirus um, and, and to manage the Russian domestic situation with coronavirus uh, in addition to, to, to promoting its own vaccine. Um, Jakob, you are in... Taipei, you seem like a uh, rational person. Well, first, why don't you explain why you're in Taipei and then explain what you think the Chinese perception on disinformation right now is. 
Right. So I'm in Taipei because my Ting Seng European Value Center for Security Policy is actually opening our branch office here in Taiwan because we want to learn from the experience of the Taiwanese civil society and government organizations in responding to Chinese intimidation, but also their disinformation and influence operations. Because basically what Ukraine or Georgia is for us in Europe on responding to Russian disinformation, that's what Taiwan in Asia in responding to Chinese disinformation. So we want to learn from them. That's why I'm here myself physically as well. Uh, but uh, clearly there are differences between what Russia and China does. Uh, but uh, at least in Europe and or Central Europe, we could see that the, those actors, Russia and China, are getting closer to each other in, uh, in some activities which they do in organizing disinformation. But very briefly, if I look, would look into just a neighboring country, uh, from where Dominica is sitting, she's in Slovakia, I'm from Czech Republic. So in the Czech Republic, and I think it's quite similar to Slovakia, we have seen, uh, let's say on a timeline since 2000s, you know, there, there has been a um, community of conspirators, people who actually believe in various uh, lies or conspiracy theories on 9-11 and uh, all the usual things, but they were completely fringe and they had no political impact uh, until 2014, when, we, when the, there was a massive mobilization organized by domestic extremists, uh, domestic uh, far-right parties, but also Russian proxies and entities in our countries in Central Europe, who actually organized and manufactured many of the leaders of our disinformation communities uh, in, in first years after Russia invaded Ukraine. And uh, that has go, go, gone on since 2014. The first topic was on Ukraine. Then it was mainly on the migration crisis, 2015 to 2017. Um, and and uh, that community of people who organize and spread this information on a massive scale in our countries in Central Europe, actually it has been, uh, I would say, being first being cultivated first from the outside, but also domestically with the far-right parties. So this nexus of quite often far-right parties, domestic extremists, quite often a part of the conspiracy theory community and uh, some international connections that has been growing. And in some countries, it got to a level where we have about uh, various parts of our societies who actually believe in various uh, disinformation theories, uh, which sometimes are geopolitical. So things like saying, you look, Ukraine is a non-state or Ukraine is governed by a fascist regime. That's a very usual disinformation in Central Europe, in Czech Republic or Slovakia. But then it turns into current crisis, like the pandemic, where much of this disinformation community currently supports or attacks the vaccination in general or attacks any government restrictions which are trying to stop the spread of the virus. And the, the, in practical terms, if you put geopolitical, as, geopolitics aside, this is actually killing people in our countries because many people do not believe COVID is a real thing. And I know it might seem absurd, but we do have some per percentages of our populations in Central Europe who are there or, or we have... Uh, I mean, depends on how you ask, but basically somewhere between 10 and 20% of at least Czech population believes vaccination is dangerous to people and it should be avoided, uh, which is their right to think about it. But we, when we see the sources, how they are getting to it, we see the links to this the original disinformation community. So it is dangerous, not only for geopolitical reasons, but also for practical individual security or, or, or human health as well. Okay. Hey, Jakob, let's just stay on that for a second. When you look at the disinformation in your home country, it's clearly partly coming from outside sources. It's partly coming from internal sources. How would you, how would you weigh it? Where do you think the majority is coming from? How would you weigh the role of outside sources versus inside sources? Well, since most of this information in our Central European countries is, is, is in domestic languages, it's not in English, it's in Czech or Slovak, it's done by, by domestic actors. So Czech citizens doing it for Czech audiences, same in Slovakia, Slovak, Slovak, Slovak audiences. So most of it is done by domestic actors, but first they have a lot of uh, inspiration from the outside, quite often Russian uh, fringe sources. Some of them use uh, directly Russian sources like Sputnik, for example, which is an official Russian state, state channel. Uh, but uh, the, the main problem is not the percentage of what comes from the outside. It's not much if you look at the percentage, but the modus operandi, which much of this disinformation community has learned, actually does come from Russian linked sources. So that's where our problem is. So it's not, not it's not as easy as we would say, look, it's all Russian, which we just cut it out because it's come from the outside. That would be easy, but that's not how it works, at least in our countries there. 
All right, and Benjamin, I want to go to you and to something you wrote in um, 2018, which I think closely relates to um, our conversation right now, where you said that obsession with Russian interference, quote, distracts attention from the real cause of populist anger, which include income stagnation, unbridled immigration, economic inequality, automation, and the opioid crisis. Do you, does that still ring true to you? Do you think we put too much attention when we talk about misinformation on outside forces and not enough on forces internally that are harming our, our Western nations? Yeah, I think the two are completely intertwined. I think Russia and China and other actors have been really good at exploiting the, the divisions and the flaws in our own societies, as well as our inability to compete geopolitically on certain theaters to push uh, their agenda and their, uh, um, and their rhetoric. Now, their narratives. I, I think that, you know, that piece, for example, was written at a time where, uh, you know, domestically in the United States, uh, so much focus was put on uh, Russian interference to explain the causes of the 2016 election at the expense of a lot of domestic reasons that also, you know, explain why voters could have been angry and could have decided to go for a populist uh, candidate. And I remember specifically, I think that I was reacting to the fact that uh, Italy at the time had voted for a populist government. And, you know, some people were, you know, ex explaining it mostly through external interference. And you had a lot of reasons in Italy at the time uh, to explain the voter disenfranchisement and and the sort of the sort of anger, so I think it is important to keep this in mind. But you know, uh, um, while pushing back against uh, disinformation, I think it's really important for our countries to just compete. You know, if you look at uh, just the, the last few months, we're talking about um, vaccines, and I've been traveling a bit in the last few months. And you go to a region like the Western Balkans, where China made major headway uh, geopolitically by uh, exporting vaccine, vaccines that, that don't work, uh, vaccines that uh, um, uh, do, um, uh, that they exported first before even uh, 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 vaccinating their own population, which is, a, of course, something that democracies can do and authoritarian regimes uh, can do. But I think this is, you know, and I remember speaking to a European official about it and said, yeah, that's a good example of Chinese interference. It's not an example of Chinese interference. It's a country doing foreign policy in the neighborhood of the European Union where Europeans are not pushing uh, their, their own interest and their own narrative. So I think, you know, typically there are uh, areas where uh, where we should be more present to just compete and defend our own, our own interest. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is another example. I'm actually very encouraged to see some of the numbers that we're hearing for the European Global Gateway Initiative, which will be uh, an investment uh, initiative uh, that will push back against Belt and Road. Some people are talking about 300 billion euros that will de be uh, devoted to this. I think it's really, you know, time uh, Europeans and Americans step up and um, and, and push back uh, to, de to defend this. Um, I am encouraged also by, you know, some of the the shifts that we're seeing uh, in Europe when it comes to, uh, to China. It's been really interesting just in the last few weeks. You see, of course, the uh, role that the Lithuanian government has been playing in uh, uh, supporting Taiwan, withdrawing from the uh, 17 plus one, making it the 16 plus one. You can see sort of the lack of momentum of the 16 plus one right now in, in Central and Eastern Euro Europe. Uh, the uh, change of government in the, in the Czech Republic, Jakub will know much more about uh, me than this, but I think clearly heading in the right direction and, you know, turning the page, I think, to uh, um, some of the pro-Russian and pro-Chinese sentiment that we had seen in the Czech government before this. Uh, Annalena Baerbock, the new German foreign minister, uh, you know, just recently from the Green Party, giving a pretty uh, strong interview on China and, uh, and Russia. And the, the role the European Parliament has played also in Brussels on issues like Taiwan or bearing the uh, uh, CAI, the China-EU uh, investment agreement. So I think we're seeing a, a, a shift and a sort of awakening from the United States and Europe that we need to compete not only on the information sphere, but also, you know, on, on the ground with, with money and, and uh, with uh, strategic uh, instruments. And how do you compete in the information sphere without leaning into your own disinformation? I think a lot of people would argue that propaganda from the West was a form of disinformation during the Cold War. I think first, you know, uh, some of the initiatives that are pushed by the European Commission on this. They're bureaucratic, they're slow, but, you know, putting platforms also to regulate themselves to address uh, disinformation and hate speech 
uh, through uh, content removal, I think is, is really important. That's where we're seeing it. We're seeing some of the debate also emerge uh, in, uh, in the United States with different sort of philosophies. You know, there's more an approach to self-regulation from the platforms in the United States, while uh, on the uh, European side, it will be more through uh, regulations, norms, and standards imposed by uh, by the Commission. But at least it's a it's a debate that's starting to emerge. And I think it's really important to have a transatlantic conversation about this. So the the, the creation of the transatlantic tech and trade council was announced after uh, President Biden's first trip to uh, to Europe to Brussels. I think is a step in the right direction. It'll be slow once again. And it's a process, but it's important to put people around the table, not only government officials, but really include the private sector in this conversation as a partner, not as an adversary that you're trying to prove, but as a partner to tackling these issues, as well as civil society uh, experts. And maybe the Summit for Democracy was still struggling a little bit to put content and substance into it, but can also be a vehicle to address some of these issues, as well as the question of uh, kleptocracy, dirty money, and corruption in our own uh, uh, democracies. But I think here again, you know, it is about uh, uh, addressing the flaws in our societies, uh, the, the the shortcomings of our own instruments that adversaries are exploiting. They're not creating it. They're fueling a, a fire that that's already there. You know, I'm French. Uh, I'm I'm seeing uh, the rise of far right candidates right now in the French presidential uh, election. I am sure that this will be encouraged by nefarious external actors uh, like Russia that will be very happy to support the campaigns of. Eric Zemmour and uh, Marine Le Pen, like they did last time. But it's also very important to be aware that most of this, the vast majority of this phenomenon is homegrown and tapping into home grievances. So, you know, you need to uh, uh, have a strategy on the information sphere, but you really also need to address the reality, uh, uh, both domestic and geopolitical, that are fueling this. Well, that leads very nicely into our first audience question. I'm going to kick this one to either James or Dominique, whoever wants to answer it, but it comes from Adeline Brion. And it's about the, you know, there's a supply side and demand side for disinformation. And the question is, do you think integrating news literacy into all school curriculum in Central Europe would help tackle this issue? How quickly can we get there? This is Adeline Brion from Lie Detectors. I can answer that if, if that's fine. Um, hi, Adeline. Um, yes, it would definitely help. Uh, because still news literacy, but also critical thinking is not really part of the curricula in most of Central European countries. And I'm not only talking about mine and well, Czech Republic is doing a bit better, but also we have Bulgaria, Romania, countries which are which are particularly, where people are particularly um, susceptible to disinformation. Um, but it's not only about news literacy um, and critical thinking, it's also about way we approach education from my perspective there is still a lot from there's still a lot of remnants from this soviet style education which was all about memorization um all about you know very just like strict rules no freedom no ability to actually get to context um and uh, merging of different subjects um so i think what we have to do is actually also revive and um, reform the way we teach history in Central Europe. Because, for example, the most of, of, of pupils in Central Europe are, are now, you know, the core attention is given to far history, to just like um, um, pupils are, are being taught a lot about, about the, the prehistoric, pre pre about like to the, the era from, from two hundreds and thousands of years ago, but there is nothing or very little being thought about the most important part of the history, which is past hundred years, which actually formed our societies because there is in some countries, there's still not enough maybe courage, not enough willingness to actually put and teach and reflect on key historical events of the past hundred years that actually formed us and created some complexes, some fears that we have in our societies. Now it's a tough sociological approach that uh, that and, and a lot of political decisions might, might be made in, in these countries, but it's extremely important to also talk about uh, to uh, new ways of, of addressing history in our countries in addition to Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to go, Yanka, back to you to talk about Taiwan for a second, because Taiwan has one of the most devoted digital democracies 
in the world. There's a lot of effort put on online education, civic engagement to a degree that no other country in, in the West has done. Also, of course, a major target for Chinese disinformation campaigns. So I'm curious if you can help explain to us in the audience what exactly Taiwan is doing that Europe, the West can learn from and what they're doing wrong as well. Yep, there, there's a long list. So just in bullet points, Taiwan is good at having government level response to, to hostile disinformation of China. Uh, be it first, the, not only the president, but also the digital minister, uh, Mr. Audrey, Audrey Chang as well. They are actually not only talking about it, but they're actually doing it. They have internal structures in governments who are actually responding to much of Chinese disinformation within two hours after publication online, which is the, the like an internal rule of the Taiwanese government, which is kind of unthinkable for Central European governments at this moment. Uh, so that's the government level response, which is good. Uh, they have a quite a robust civil society, which is actually working quite independently of the Taiwanese government, uh, because of they don't want to get politicized that much internally in Taiwan. So that's that's a good thing here in Taiwan as well. There's a, there are so many NGOs actually doing various levels of the jobs, so from exposure to media literacy programs for the kids, but also for elderly people. So that's quite active here. Uh, th th those are things which are positive, uh, but it's not a, it's not an easy situation for Taiwan, not only geopolitically, but also internally, because Taiwan is not only full of, let's say, young, energetic people who read everything online and who are who understand the geopolitics well. Taiwan is also filled, uh, full of uh, many people who voted for, uh, let's say, a post uh, post autocratic party, meaning the KMT here, uh, which actually wants to, to some extent, still be united with China. Uh, so that part of electorate is still here, and they they need to be included in the like domestic narratives of the civil society and of the government of Taiwan here. So it's not an easy situation internally in Taiwan. Uh, and Taiwan is actually not very good, I would say, or is learning now how to engage international partners outside of the US or Japan, the traditional partners but also how to engage with us in Europe uh, because there is very little connections between Central Eastern Europe which is a lot of let's say similar historical experience with authoritarian regimes ourselves uh, and also we have a lot of experience with Russian led and disinformation and domestic extremists that's what we have in Central Europe and that's what Taiwan actually can learn from a lot uh, so it's, it's we are just getting started with that there has been very little connections on this part between Central Europe and Taiwan until a couple of years ago uh, because of lack of interest both sides uh, so that's 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 quite positive and uh, one more thing where Taiwan can actually learn from is um, what I would call the Baltic experience where countries in the Baltic region the three democratic republics there are actually quite good in I would say mobilizing their own populations not only on geopolitical and military style threats, but also on like internal, I would call it positive narratives of their own uh, first democratization and second economic and social uh, uh, successes of their populations. Because if you compare the Baltic countries to most of post-Soviet countries in the re Eastern European region, the Baltics are clearly winning it in every, every indicator you take in. Uh, so there are good lessons they did in last 30 years in the Baltic region, in the Baltic republics, which where Taiwan can learn a lot from. They are still struggling on some levels, for example, how to deal with their own history here in Taiwan, which are not very good at do, doing it, I would say, compared to, I think, for example, some of us in Central Europe, where we have quite, quite bad memories from uh, things which happened prior to 1990. So interesting. Explain briefly when you say that uh, Taiwan responds within two hours to any Chinese disinformation, what does that mean? Yeah, uh, Taiwanese digital minister Audrey Tang has a, has a set up a government policy which says that every uh, state institution in Taiwan, there is like internal mechanism of coordination inside of the Taiwanese government. And when there is a, there is a public disinformation which is openly attacking something more strategic here in Taiwan, there needs to be a public response by the Taiwanese government into it, uh, which needs to be short, understandable, and needs to happen within two hours after the disinformation is published 
published online, which you could imagine how hard it is for any bureaucracy in the in the world. So, and the Taiwanese are still learning learning how to do it. Uh, but if you compare it to what we are doing in Central and Eastern Europe, most of countries in our region are not even trying to get get it out at that fast. I know quickness is not the only parameter here, but that's all, an interesting thing which where Taiwan tries to do it. And to some extent, I would say it is successful. For example, in using let's say less serious uh, uh, communication style with its with with its citizens. So obviously they have a very serious uh, communication channels, but they are also using a lot of infographics. Where, I mean the Taiwanese government is towards its own population, which seems to be quite successful compared to most of our region, our countries in Central Europe. Sounds like my old job running online news at the New Yorker, where you have to you know if something happens you have to respond in two hours. We have a good question here from Gold, uh, Gordon Holden. I'm going to kick it to James because you've written books related to the answer to this question, but here is, uh, here's Mr. Hulden's question. Both China and Russia spend heavily on state media programs. In China's case, this is especially true in less developed countries, where both state and private networks have limited funding. Should the West restrict the access of these programs in the own states, and should the West develop counter-programming abroad more than is already being done? Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a great question. Um, I think traditionally the calculus has been one of reciprocity. So we broadcast in their countries, they broadcast in ours, and VOA, BBC, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, should be more attractive. They they should win, and we shouldn't be so interested in RT and the Chinese news network because it's poor quality news. Um, clearly, something isn't quite working the way it used to, or the way we thought it should. Um, but I don't think that means we can start restricting this. I think it's that would likely lead to, to VOA, BBC being restricted uh, back in those countries. And it would also give a shot in the arm, I think, to um, more authoritarian countries who want to shut down on a, on a pluralist um, media. So I, I think that's a mistake. I think the really the, 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 the last part of this question is the way to go which is to improve the attractiveness of our own programming, uh, you know, VOA, BBC, these, these credible high quality news, um, and find ways of helping that to compete with this, this, this clearly junk news, as, as Oxford Institute, uh, Internet Institute likes to call it, uh, this junk news that is very attractive to read, but, you know, can, can we compete with that in a way that's, engaging but also truthful um, and meets the standards of, of uh, what, what, you know, the highest standards of editorial independence. Makes good amount of sense. All right, let's talk a little bit about the role of the platforms and how their behavior, how one, how states and governments and individuals can incentivize better behavior and can regulate for the sake of better behavior. Uh, Dominique, do you want to take that question first? What should European countries do to the large social media platforms, which spread lots of good information, and also, if I've read it correctly, a little bit of bad information too. Absolutely. So this is a topic I'm very passionate about because uh, we've uh, at WOPSEC we've uh, founded an initiative which is called the Alliance for a Healthy Infosphere, which actually actually gathers um, civil society organizations which are pro. Uh, fighting for 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 a healthy and just information space, and uh, since I'm from the EU side, I'm very pro regulation person um, in in this respect. So, um, one of the key issues we have to tackle, and it actually relates to what James already said, um, how to actually create this balance of having more trustful sources and media in on our social new media feeds, in our social media feeds compared to private information sources. Um, one of the ways would be regulating the algorithms. Um, the EU has actually put out a act which is called the EU AI Act, uh, which is trying to uh, target some of the, or regulate some of the AI systems which are being used. From our perspective, algorithms used by social media companies to recommend um, the uh, content which is being portrayed on each of our social media news feeds needs to be somehow uh, tackled. It, it, there need to be strict rules and there needs to be transparency to these algorithms because so far we have had no idea about 
how they're using our data, what kind of content they're recommending to each of us um, um, based on what behavior or, or um, based on what behavior or characteristic. Um, so, so, so this is one way that we should definitely look at it to see, to restrict algorithms which um, um, guide recommendation systems in, in social media feeds um, in a way that they could recognize this information and not recommend this information to, 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 to regular users. So this would be one way. The other way is, and this is also, uh, the EU is also doing some work in this, it's regarding political advertising. From our perspective, or from my perspective, micro-targeting, meaning targeting of users with ads based on our behavior, our characteristics, personality traits, um, is dangerous because it can actually um, exploit our fears um, and our weakest points very well. Um, so, so restricting micro-targeting is, is a second very important, very important matter. And the third, and this is the most challenging one, is demonetization. Um, the disinformation sources, disinformation sites are profiting from posting disinformation online. As long as they profit, they will continue doing that. So we have to find a way how to actually stop uh, Google or other advertisers to stop placing advertising advertisements on, on disinformation sources. This would, of course, need to create uh, some kind of disinformation database or database of disinformation sources, but I'm sure that academics and so civil society can help with that. Um, but this is, yes, a third very large challenge that we're facing. Anybody want to either, uh, anybody want to disagree or add on to Dominica's regulatory framework of algorithmic regulation, blocking micro-targeting and demonetization? Jakob? Can I add? Yeah, please. Yes. I completely agree. I would just add that uh, actually, I, I think the EU is not very good in some of national security issues, but in on some issues focused on privacy uh, it's, uh, or, or specific uh, human rights issues related to it. The EU is actually very good and in some levels, uh, really a leading global actor, uh, where the, which, the, which the platforms like Facebook need to and do take seriously compared to many other places globally, uh, which is good news for all of us sitting in Europe. Uh, and the, the, the thing I would add is that uh, I'm afraid that we will actually spend next, dec next decades seeing the Chinese Communist Party's push for gathering a lot of data on individuals and, and societies. And as is already happening, but we will be seeing it more and more. And uh, when this keeps going, actually what the EU can do, we cannot stop the Chinese Communist Party from doing it, unfortunately. But what we can do is that we can actually close down some of the vulnerabilities we have in Europe by, for example, having quite a tight regulatory framework, which would not allow companies like in this case, in this case, it's mainly Western companies like Facebook, but in the future, uh, Chinese companies like TikTok, for example, which would actually make it harder for them to collect individual data, which would be then be analyzed by artificial intelligence tools by, for example, the Chinese government, which would make, make uh, targeting much easier. And I don't mean commercial targeting, but I mean, for example, uh, the recruitment attempts which they do uh, on individuals, but if, the, if we allow them to do it for upcoming years, they will have so much much data in such a great quality, which would be, and they'll have a, what I would call informational dominance or knowledge dominance. So, so to some extent, China would know much more about our own societies and individuals than we as, for example, European countries would know about our own societies. So that's the danger. And what we can do about it is to use some of the EU regulatory framework on, for example, privacy issues. So that's a step in the right direction. I think the EU is doing quite a good job compared to other should, areas. Jakob, do you think the EU should ban TikTok? I don't think banning is the right right way how to do it because there are ways how to get around it as well. I think using a tight regulatory framework and having serious fines if somebody breaks the rules because the, and that's by the way happening. There are fines happening. They are not big enough, I would say, uh, because the big companies are still good at lobbying against them. So I think the EU, EU and or specifically the European Commission is still learning how to do it, but they are trying, and I think they are trying quite well. Hmm. All right. Let me ask, uh, Benjamin, let me bring you back in for a geopolitical question. So we've talked a little bit about regulations of tech companies. We've talked about civic engagement. We've talked about all kinds of good things we can do. We've talked a little bit about government propaganda and news. What about government action? Like when Russia 
disrupts an election, should NATO respond and take out the electric grid in Moscow? Like, what is the where does the line that we should go up to? What is the line we should not cross in retaliatory responses? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that's part of the debate right now, right? Is uh, you know, to what extent do you consider that an act of interference in the democratic process, like we've seen in the 2016 election or 2017 election in France? is considered uh, uh, you know, almost an act of war and deserves a uh, kinetic response. Uh, you know, what was interesting in the 2017 French election is uh, some of French officials drew uh, conclusions and lessons from uh, the American inaction in 2016. And you had, in the midst of the campaign, uh, the foreign minister, uh, Jean-Marc Ayrault, who explicitly named Russia as being uh, interfering in the French election. And we know that some behind the scene messages were sent to Russian officials that this would not be tolerated. So, you know, how do you calibrate the response? Do you go for some form of a cyber uh, attack? Or of course we've had sanctions uh, after 2016 and 2017, but I think that's really should be part of the, um, of the conversation. I mean, it's clearly about increasing the costs of aggression like we're seeing right now in the debate, you know, we very, real uh, conversation about a potential invasion of uh, Ukraine with 175,000 uh, Russian troops are amassed at the, uh, the border uh, uh, with Ukraine. How can we you know, convey a, a clear message that uh, this, will be, uh, this will be addressed, not just with sanctions, but with some form of, uh, of kinetic uh, response? And what should that kinetic response be? And what should it not be? Anyone can take that question. Jakob? If I may add, I think specifically on the current Ukraine issue, I think what, what could and should happen is that some of the NATO member states, I don't think NATO as a, as a whole, that's impossible, but some of the willing NATO states could actually, on the invitation uh, of the Ukraine government, send uh, uh, specific military units or at least military observers to the conflict line uh, so that those people are physically here and they could also, let's say, serve as to some extent a deterrent, but to some extent as a um, as a signal that actually NATO countries are willing to do much more for Ukraine. Because uh, we have seen that, uh, I mean, NATO or European countries in NATO are actually good at having military deterrence against Russia. So, so far we see Russia not invading NATO countries and that's good. But uh, what we don't have is that we don't have much of a non-military response, which means that Russia keeps doing the hostilities to us from election interference to paying extremists in our countries to ma massive disinformation campaigns. Uh, so Russia still thinks, or Russian government still thinks it is worth doing it because we are not punishing it for we're punishing the Russian government for doing it. So just to give an example, if you look at through the EU sanctions list, you do not have people who spread and organize disinformation on the Russian state level against the European countries. If you scan the US sanctions list, you have many of those people on these lists. Uh, and the, just comparing the ways how the how the sanctions regime between US and Europe work, uh, then you see the examples where Europe is not doing enough. Uh, and and we might say yes, because there are other reasons for it. But I think in reality, until recently, for example, one of the main organizers of political uh, influence of Russia in Germany, um, uh, Vladimir Yakunin was actually having an, uh, having his own think tank sitting in central Berlin without any German government interference. And he was actually uh, doing a lot of political interference in German politics. Uh, but that's the same person who is on a US sanction list because of the invasion of Ukraine in 2014. So just to give, those are many examples we could discuss, but th there are ways, there are practical things we should should be doing uh, as European countries. And until now, very little of these are being done. I mean, on non-military response. James and Dominika, does this sound right to you? Or does it sound maybe, oh, Benjamin, you want to jump in here? Yeah, no, I would. I agree with what Jakub said. And I think, you know, there there is a, uh, a panoply of things that could be done in uh, in response and that should be signaled before as a, as a deterrent. I mean, clearly increasing the, the cost of economic sanctions, especially on the European side, because as Jakub noted, I mean, first, the scope of some of these sanctions is different between the United States and Europe, and there's much more economic penetration between the European Union and Russia than there is with the United States. So that would, you know, have a deeper impact uh, on the on the Russian side. Um, but you could, you know, you can definitely uh, support uh, the Ukrainian military and send uh, military equipment, which was something that the Obama administration decided not to do 
uh, at the time. Uh, you can send potentially observers, special forces on the uh, uh, on the Ukrainian side. But I think if you also signal that an intervention, Russian intervention, would shift some of the uh, US and NATO military posture in the rest of Europe, thus accomplishing exactly the opposite of what Russian objectives seem to be, because Russia right now is signaling that it wants to have a veto on NATO accession, on the US force, force posture, even beyond Ukraine in, in Central and Eastern Europe. If an intervention in Ukraine would lead to more American troops and more NATO troops in Central and Eastern Europe, in Southeast Europe as well by the Black Sea, uh, that also is, is something that could act as a, as a deterrent if you really uh, convey that signal. I think that's probably what's uh, being done right now uh, uh, behind closed doors. But yeah, I think there is a, uh, there's a range of, of options uh, to convey that go beyond the sort of straw man of, you know, let's, uh, on the one hand, let's agree to uh, Russia's interpretation of Minsk II and just uh, give up or uh, all out uh, a war, of course. Uh, James or Dominique, you want to respond to that? Does that sound like a reasonable policy proposal to you, or does it sound like we could be stepping into something that gets us into a greater level of digital cyber war? You know, I fully agree with both the speakers. I think we can we can say that the for both NATO and the EU, the the sort of Article Five level is very very clear. The cyber kind of sanctions and deterrent toolkit is getting clearer, much sharper but on hybrid and disinfo it's still quite fuzzy um, and that's probably where a lot of energy is going to need to be spent um, clarifying that seeing what's possible don't forget a lot of what we're talking about in the disinformation realm is also not illegal so there's a question of you know on what grounds um, can these uh, can sanctions regimes be applied all right so if i've taken the notes correctly it appears as though this whole panel, all four of you agree on kind of like five different levels of responses to solving this problem. Some level of education to build up internal resiliency, some level of government response coordination modeled kind of like what Taiwan is doing, a series of regulations on the tech platforms to decrease the amount of bad information, increase the amount of good, improvement of cyber sanctions uh, to deal with disinformation in that level, since we haven't really figured that out, and then perhaps some greater threat of kinetic retaliation. Is that roughly where everybody is and is there a level that is missed in that five-part structure. Does anybody want to respond or does anybody want to attack one of the other panelists to say that they're completely wrong on some level of that? Um, Dominica. Sorry, no attacking, but I would just add one more um, factor and that is tackling corruption. Um, we've uh, recently published a study called the Globsec Vulnerability Index when we measure internal vulnerabilities to external influence, meaning Russian and Chinese. Um, and we've identified corruption as one of the key vulnerabilities within all states actually in Central and Eastern Europe that needs to be tackled because corrupted minds um, are actually vulnerable to any kind of influences, uh, which, which can, yeah. Um, I mean, Benjamin has already uh, touched upon it a little bit, but um, corruption um, also extends to the fact that, you know, um, politicians or, or, or high level figures who actually stop being politically active, then they join some um, mm, consortia or, or, or some boards at uh, large Russian companies or, or later Chinese companies. And this is something where we are actually being very much vulnerable. If, if Jakob, I can... you wanna, oh, uh, Benjamin, then Jakob. Just two finger, because I think what was said is really critical. Uh, th there is the question of sort of anticipated corruption, where you know that you're going to be rewarded uh, by uh, a board or or uh, some you know very extravagant speaking fees in uh, undemocratic uh, countries if you know that you take certain foreign policy positions. So that's something that could be regulated at the European level. You know, thinking about some form of rules for heads of states, prime ministers, and of course members. Of, uh, of a European institution. I think it's already the case for members of European institutions, but if that could be spread to member states, I think that would be really important. What's so interesting with the way the conversation about kleptocracy and corruption has shifted a bit in the last uh, you know, five, 10 years uh, here in the US and a little bit less so in Europe, it's, it's really become a foreign policy issue. It's really become a sovereignty issue. You know, It's not just about transparency or human rights. It's really about leverage that countries like Russia, it, to a lesser extent for now, China, but increasingly so 
are using in our own democracies to be able to constrain our ability to conduct foreign policy because of, of the investments that they will make in real estate or in politics or in strategic uh, uh, industries. That's exactly what China has been doing, you know, with, with Belt and Road as well. Is you understand that economic investments come with uh, uh, political clout come with strings attached. And that's something that uh, we're only starting to uh, um, to realize how the two are, are interconnected. Stan Jakob? Two things which we didn't discuss that much. Uh, one, European countries need uh, basically a lobbying transparency act, something what FARA is in the US for an agent's registration act, something similar to European countries need very much. We don't have anything which would really regulate uh, domestic lobbying with some extent of foreign interference as well. Uh, Australia has a new one in just in recent years called Transparency Scheme. There are difficulties with it as well. So we in Europe could actually adopt a new ones, which actually would be almost perfect. And second, uh, working with the allies and new allies as well, because for example, uh, Taiwan is an ally of the United States, if you look at the whole Congress and uh, other US entities are saying, but Taiwan one has no direct link to European countries, uh, while it is a de, a de facto frontline in, regard, in regards to various Chinese hostilities. So I'm not saying we should uh, abandon one China policy, but we could actually change a lot of things which Europe is doing with countries like Taiwan, uh, not only to learn from them, but also to support them, because I honestly believe that actually Taiwan is something what West Berlin was during the Cold War. It's, it's a first point of direct confrontation uh, uh, unfortunately, or it might be even in a military sense, uh, at least it is in the geopolitical interference sense uh, at this moment. Um, and if we don't so support countries like Taiwan now, uh, they will be, we will be actually looking back at a situation where Europe can do very little in a in, in couple of years on in regards to countries like Taiwan. So I'm thinking that's something what I think should be changed. And it is slowly changing in some countries in Europe, but not fast enough, I would be afraid. James, do you want to add anything to our meta agenda? Yeah, I don't think we've really talked about government capabilities. Um, for example, in Sweden, they're about to create a, a public agency for psychological defense. Um, it probably won't be called that in English, but the idea is that it gathers together um, knowledge across the government and coordinates uh, on questions related to disinformation foreign influence. Uh, we're seeing something similar announced in France as well. Um, but then they're also, you know, work on like capacity building within communication so that if there's something up, some harmful disinformation that governments can get out there, protect the public as they've been doing around coronavirus. Um, and then questions of coordination uh, between public and private sectors and government. Um, so there's quite a big role still for, for particularly European governments where there's an expectation of them providing public services in, in this area alongside many others. Well, that's a, a good lead up to maybe our last five minutes. I mean, we do have members of the European Commission who are, I believe it, there's a large number of them in our audience today. Uh, Dominica, what do you want to add to their agenda and how else do you want them to be uh, thinking about this in the, in the year ahead? Absolutely. So um, one of the issues that we've been advocating for is to actually focus on strategic communication and better strategic communication towards from the EU, both EU and NATO, to the particular member states, uh, because so far um, both the EU and NATO um, have been investing a lot in, in, in the campaigns to be present in, in the specific member states, um, but often those have been one size fit all campaigns. Uh, and these unfortunately just don't work in, 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 in the respective member states. So I would definitely um, ask the, 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 the institutions and the people who work in the institutions and are able to actually um, push forward some of the strategies and in, in campaigning to change the strategies to be as member state specific as possible, because people in every member state have different fears, have different issues that are polarizing and that they listen to. So this is something that, that I consider extremely important. Great, I'm gonna uh, ask one last question. This is from Susan and it's uh, maybe James or Benjamin, you wanna take this. So here's Susan's question. The National Committee conducts track two and track one and a half discussions. One concern I have is the lack of track one dialogue between Russia, the US, EU, and the same with China. 
Is this something we could recommend to Western countries that disinformation and nefarious influence discussions could, and we could come to an agreement on how to handle this, or is that just a theoretical dream? Could we have discussions about this with China and Russia? Last, that's the last question of this panel. Who wants to take it? Benjamin. No, I think of course we can have discussions. I and mean, we had arms controls discussion over, you know, nuclear debates at the height of the, the Cold War. The, the question is, you know, as uh, Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify, make your red lines clear, have uh, clear uh, instruments to punish and retaliate if uh, your uh, the, the rules are not uh, not respected. You know, it is important to be able to have a framework to, uh, to de-escalate, a framework to communicate, make sure that, you know, you can also maybe avoid uh, misunderstandings the, if, if the case arises, but, you know, not be naive about what you can achieve in such frameworks, but just at least, you know, have something to, uh, uh, to verify and to push back if, it, if uh, it's not respected. James, do you want to add a thought here? Um, yeah, I think it's also important to have some kind of leverage if we go into these discussions. So, for example, EU versus Disinfo, the, um, the, the website that attributes um, open source um, Russian disinformation uh, that's hosted by the European External Action Service. You know, when that publishes something, it's an attribution. If, if the Russian government doesn't agree, then they can make representations and that's the start of the dialogue. But if you don't have the levers that come from making attributions from, you know, not being afraid of upsetting a, a country, then it's always them coming to you with, with threats and, and their own leverage. And, and I think we can be more proactive and get better at the kind of going out, attributing, having more of a deterrent proactive approach um, and letting that be part of our leverage with them uh, because otherwise it's it's just them coming and complaining to us makes sense all right well last minute i'm going to hand it over to susan susan um i'm handing you the microphone thank you for letting us have this uh, wonderful and highly productive conversation yeah well thanks to all of thanks to you nick and thanks to all the panelists and thanks for asking um you know for answering the question that i posed at the end because i think um you know one of the the objectives of the national committee is to promote dialogue uh and to try to resolve conflicts and i've seen that there's a lack of you know track one discussion especially between us and russia and us and china and so um i think the idea that we brought up and especially how to avoid um, issues might be a good thing that um, that governments need to discuss whether they can come to agreement. And I agree with Benjamin. There have to be you know specific guardrails, guidelines for that. So anyway, thank you again for addressing um, this very uh, important and um, and problem that I don't think is going to go away anytime soon. So uh, thanks again, and thanks to Nick uh, for moderating a great discussion, and thanks to all our, our participants who listened to today's program.